Some of our material in today's session I cover in more detail in my introduction and reading of the book of Revelation, which I recorded last year in an Orthodox chapel on the island of Patmos. So if you want to dig deeper, you can get the full teaching on johncrowder.net. Now look, I don't claim to have a grid for everything in the book of Revelation or every apocalyptic end time passage. But what I will say is that primarily apocalyptic passages are full of symbolism and allegory. And we must be extremely careful about attaching rigid literal interpretations to every biblical allegory. Literal accounts in scripture should be taken quite literally. But in metaphor, to call Christ a rock of the ages does not mean he's literally a mineral deposit. And to call him the Lion of Judah does not make him a feline. Modern evangelicals who teach an eschatology, an end times view of God as this cosmic Orwellian genocidal maniac, they major heavily on a newly innovated fantasy called the rapture. This is where Jesus partially returns, zips away the saints in a Houdini act. They get sucked out of their pants, leave their car unmanned on the highway. Meanwhile, Jesus circles in a holding pattern and then returns another time to kill off all the Democrats, gays, and Muslims. Somehow, the apocalypse has been boiled down in many people's mind to a story of this one thing. So before we begin, allow me to tell you what Revelation is not about, okay? The rapture is never once mentioned in the book of Revelation or the Bible itself. I may not have the so-called end times all mapped out, but I can at least tell you that the rapture is one bit of eschatology that I can talk about quite easily because it doesn't exist. The real definition of the word rapture is the same as trance. It is ecstasis. It has to do with this pleasurable overpowering of the Holy Spirit uh, that we call filled with the Spirit, baptized with the Spirit, soaking, contemplation, ecstasy, carpet time, slain in the Spirit, drinking in the Spirit, etc. In fact, the Apostle John fell into a rapture, into a trance on the island of Patmos over 1900 years ago where he was also caught up into the visionary experiences that that make up the book of Revelation. But rapture never had anything to do with mass disappearing acts. That idea came from the interpretation of a vision from a lady named Margaret MacDonald in the mid-1800s. Later, it was popularized, her vision, in the John Nelson Darby's Bible. And it didn't flourish, really, until later revivalism in America. What we now have concerning the rapture is essentially an American invention popularized in recent decades in Tim LaHaye's fiction and Kirk Cameron B-movies. No major figure in church history ever split the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, into separate parts like stop-and-go traffic where he comes to get the saints and then he goes back home for a nap and then he returns either seven years or three and a half years later. Uh, depends on if he carpools with the Father and the Holy Ghost, takes the express lane. Let me tell you who never believed in the rapture. Okay, Martin Luther, John Knox, John Calvin, Uldrich Zwingli. William Tyndale, John Wycliffe, John Wesley, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Matthew Henry, Charles Finney, Charles Spurgeon, or let's take it further back, Polycarp, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Athanasius, Augustine, John Chrysostom, Ambrose, Jerome, or anyone at the Council of Nicaea who formed the Apostles' Creed. And then what about the Millennium? Well, that's another big end times topic of speculation. Can we honestly say who really knows what that is? It's the thousand years of peace that Christians continually argue about. Look, it is all speculation, but some scholars, they date the book of Revelation as being before 70 AD. The, the majority of scholars think it was after 80, 70 AD, but the earlier dating suggests that the book of John's prophecy here may have related specifically to the downfall of Jerusalem that happened in 70 AD, where the blood of 8,500 Jews was spilled right in the very temple, defiling its courts uh, before it was torn down stone by stone by the Romans. 
despite the left behind fairy tales today, look, Jesus' prophecies of this very occurrence in Matthew 24, in his Olivet Discourse, were not reserved for some future new world order. Our Lord tells us that that very generation would not pass away until those very things took place. And so people who realize this rapture fiction has no biblical basis, they often gravitate towards another end time view called preterism or partial preterism. Partial preterism says that all or most of those apostolic end time events uh, warnings took place in 70 AD. Okay? And full-blown preterism, not partial, but just full-blown preterism, that says that even Jesus' return has already happened, spiritually, so there's no second coming of Christ. The day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, was all allegorical of Jesus returning in the clouds in 70 AD. Now understand that I have many friends in both the preterism and partial preterism camps. And as a side note, I don't think that one's eschatological end-time views are very high on the list of theological priority. And dogmatic folks think, I mean, they hate it when I say this. Uh, they think it's all about end-times guesswork, but that's all it is. It's just guesswork. Okay, I personally tend to believe the bulk of Matthew 24 did indeed relate to the events of 70 AD. And I lean towards partial preterism. But I am by no means a full-blown preterist because I believe the church creeds and I prefer orthodoxy and believe in the incarnation, not just some spiritual Jesus who already returned. But even partial preterism to me gets too dogmatic because they have to fit everything in their little box and revolve everything around 70 AD instead of around the person of Jesus Christ. They say the old covenant ended at 70 AD. No, the veil of Christ's flesh was torn and it all came to halt in a person on the tree. Look, 70 AD was just the first big shockwave, the first big ramification of the collapse of that old legal system, the first major manifestation. Like when you throw a rock into a pond and the first big boom, concentric circle begins to go out and the, the, the further ramifications throughout time and space. But look, 70 AD, that was the first big wave. But the center of it all was the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the rock that hit the pond. See, people start going overboard with this, and they start interpreting everything through 70 AD. Eschatology cannot be our leading hermeneutic. Jesus Christ is our leading hermeneutic. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He is perfect eschatology. He is the divine logos. So look, I am more of an eschatological agnostic. I don't pretend to know what it's all going to look like in the end. I just know that it looks like Jesus and it's all going to be okay. I think the error of left behind Tim LaHaye rapture theology has caused this knee-jerk swing to this other ditch of full-on preterism that says Christ has already returned. Again, he returned spiritually in 70 AD, the, the, the full preterists say. Don't, don't you realize, though, that every cult, when they miss their prediction of the return of Christ, whether Jehovah's Witnesses or the Millerites or the Children of God cult, or whatever it may be, when they miss their predicted appointment of when Jesus is scheduled to return, they say, well, he did return spiritually on that day. No, dude, that's a cop-out. My friends, this denies the incarnation. He will return in the same way he departed the man, Jesus Christ, physical, resurrected Jesus Christ. Now, of course, the majority, if not all, of prophetic passages have been literally fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, all the prophets are pointing to him. But that doesn't mean we simply file them all away into the past as if they're utterly irrelevant. They're often still pregnant with meaning for our own lives. For instance, let me jump back to the book of Revelation for a moment. John writes that there's a blessing on reading this book, not necessarily on figuring it all out, Literal interpretations are a dime a dozen with this book. So hold it open-handedly. Don't get dogmatic about your conclusions. Even good isms, like partial preterism, can turn into dogmatic boxes that get our focus off of Jesus or cause us to ignore certain scripture, even though certain scriptures should not be interpreted in a way that scares us. But again, look, I embrace 
eschatological agnosticism, which is sometimes referred to as pan-millennialism. It will all pan out in the end. Rather than trying to get our prophetic ducks in a row and figure everything out, perhaps instead it's more helpful to embrace raw, blind trust in the one who does have everything figured out. Now this, of course, is not to ignore the apocalypse or to be lazy in our study as if we shouldn't look into this stuff at all, but rather let our minds be flooded with its imagery in such a way that we get immersed with the story itself rather than just our own logical human extrapolations about it. I mean, in a sense, perhaps I hold to a bit of eschatological idealism, like Karl Barth, like Schweitzer, uh, Boltman, Altheus. I wonder if these texts maybe refer to the ultimacy of the present moment, not so much in a chronologically displaced future, but the Christian eschaton, the end of all things, rests not on some future finality or coming death and rebirth of the cosmos. What if it rests in an interior realization of a death and new birth that has already taken place in Christ and which is continually set before us to confront each day in the reality of the now? There are various theological schools of thought along these lines, such as realized eschatology or supratemporal eschatology and eschatology that's not locked into a future timeline, but it stands outside of time, pointing us more to an existential crisis of the present life and death of every individual believer in the moment, confronting us with the severity of his right now love. I mean, maybe you believe a literal hooker is going to come out of the sea on a red horny dragon. Uh, perhaps we've locked these apocryphal texts into space and time in a way that they weren't overly intended. Now, I don't believe in allegorizing everything like Origen or, or some Gnostic person. So let's not, it's not to say these passages are purely a rhetorical device, but I'm just saying, what if they convey existential truths, because they're metaphors, to bring the individual hope rather than just a history or future history of overly literalistic promised end time events that are going to be played out in a coming age. It's not simply about the future, it's about a person. And it's not a simple, clear sequence, some one-dimensional chronology of events, but it's a book of images that just splatter everywhere, and we must just jump into the fray of it and let God speak instead of just putting it in the file cabinet and say, this happened here, that happened over there. For instance, perhaps the beast represents social injustice, wicked political power, materialism, imperialism, or outright carnality, and the old fleshly animalistic nature of fallen Adam, all of these things. Things, okay, And if we're just barking up the wrong Da Vinci Code tree to think that Revelation is just some secret cipher or code book of cloaked messages that we got to figure out for insiders to, to uh, figure out the true predictions, then dude, you're seeing Obama as the Antichrist or uh, Trump or the Pope or every Pope was called the Antichrist. Every president was called, was called the Antichrist. Martin Luther was called the Antichrist. Every world dictator was called the Antichrist. And John says there are many antichrists, not just one. People think Hillary Clinton is the whore of Babylon. The Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon. Hey, I know plenty of Methodist whores as well. Look, I'm not trying to invent an easy out by just saying we need to embrace mystery, but the fact is we don't like mystery. In our Western Greek linear mindsets, we want strict, pat answers of how it all plays out. To say you embrace mystery is considered a cop-out or not studying. Look, Revelation is full of visionary apocalyptic language whose symbols are going all over the place. Rather than trying to get behind the text for some subliminal meanings, just allow the text to draw you into the visionary world it creates and embrace it. And for God's sake, don't just try to oversimplify everything. Leave it in the tension of parable and you will draw a million valuable nuggets from it. Only a mystic can be at peace with this book. If there is a single linear outworking of judgment passages, again, I do lean towards the earlier 70 AD scenario, which marked the end of the sacrificial Old Covenant system of law with the destruction of the Jewish temple and the fall of Jerusalem 
by the Romans. After that, after 70 AD, John's remarks uh, about Christian persecution by the Jews, the synagogue of Satan, that kind of would have been irrelevant if the book was written after 70 AD. So yeah, I lean towards an earlier writing. I lean, if you're going to do a literal interpretation, yes, partial preterism is perhaps the best ism out there. But a hallmark of eschatological agnosticism of I don't know is that I also choose not to preclude the possibility of any future in time fulfillment scenarios, future concentric circle shock waves. I just don't know. I hold it loosely in grace. Perhaps there is a parabolic tension to this book as it is living scripture, which makes it directly applicable to any age and every individual believer. And above all, the primary mystical fulfillment of this book is summed up in its very title, The Unveiling of Jesus Christ. Hence, it cryptically conveys the judgment and destruction of our own sinful reprobation, the annihilation of our old nature and fallen Adam, and the overthrow of that superstructure of sin, death, and hell with all oppressive worldly systems, which are all swallowed up in the lake of his fiery, all-consuming love and victory. Again, perhaps its greatest power lies in its penetrating devotional quality. And this is really what I'm trying to get at. Like a mirror to expose one's own soul. It exposes our fears and insecurities and at times the delusional sinful existence under which we may be operating the false self in order to awaken us to Christ's victory in our own lives. So that's my two cents. Take a mystical approach. Remember that Jesus Christ is the ultimate telos, the end of all things. He is perfect eschatology. This is not the revelation of the Antichrist. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, if this piques your interest, there is much more on this in my Book of Revelation audio. If you want to dig deeper, get out of the ism boxes, you can get the full teaching on johncrowder.net. And here's a quick rundown of our limited 2018 event schedule that I want to cover with you real quick. The main event I'd recommend is to you married couples, uh, get your spouse this for Christmas. Bring them to Hawaii. We have a life-changing weekend in February in Maui. This thing's filling up, but we do still have spaces available. So check it out at thenewmystics.com slash retreat. And in January, I have a mystical school in Charlotte, North Carolina, my only event in the South. In January, we have an event in Poland, a gospel party in Warsaw. In February, we have a mystical school in France. And in April, I have a mystical school coming to Springfield, Illinois. In May, we have a mystical school coming to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. In June, I have my only England event for the year in Bristol, UK. And in August, I have a mystical school in Northern Ireland, in Belfast. Plus, we got a conference with Baxter Kruger and Godfrey Bertel in Scotland. Uh, the three of us also have a gentleman's retreat we're doing on the island of Isla, Scotland. Theology, worship, and whiskey tastings. Okay, we can only fit 20 guys on that one. Spaces are filling up. Uh, it's next August. Also, my only event with Baxter in the USA is going to be in Las Vegas with Zach Wexler next fall. So that is, again, my limited sabbatical year schedule for 2018. So if you see something you like on there, lock in a spot early. You can find them all at thenewmystics.com slash schools. Sons of Thunder runs on partnerships and generous contributions from people like you. If you've been blessed by the ministry and want to participate in sharing the gospel and reaching the poor with us, consider becoming a monthly supporter at thenewmystics.com partners.